today on the Ginger Engine, we read and review Tank Engine Thomas again, the fourth book in the Railway series, which was published on the 31st of December 1949. However, will our non-Thomas fan give this book a yay or a nay? Stay tuned to find out. Welcome aboard the Ginger Engine. First of all, we need to check your tickets. And how do we do that? By hitting that big subscribe button and ringing the bell to be notified about our latest videos. And we'll always be sure to keep the trains running on schedule. So my fellow steamers, you've noticed something different. We are actually have faces. What you can see is, this doesn't often happen in the Thomas community. We actually get to see the people doing the work. So we thought we would take the, the game up a level. We're starting off with your driver, which is myself, Andrew Durning. And we have our fireman, which is... Thomas Lawrence. And we've also got our railway inspector. Matthew Hill. Now, we like to be very honest with our audience members, and we have to say that, unfortunately, uh, our very important passenger, Fran Gilmartin, has had to pull out of the show for personal reasons. Obviously, she's welcome back anytime she wants, whenever she feels ready to come back. We love you, we miss you, and hope things get better soon. But we still have to have some female representation. We don't want a total sausage fest. That is why we have brought a very lovely, talented radio presenter from Sunny Govan Radio, Susan Sutton. Hello. Susan, thank you so much for coming on and being part of this insanity. I like insanity. I think, I think we all like insanity and fairness. Well, um, so aside from the fact that I'm paying you, what, what, what made you want to come on this? <laughs> aside, from the, aside from the money. <laughs> I like to go on journey, mystery journeys a lot. Mm. And this is definitely going to be filled with mystery because I haven't got a clue <laughs> what it's all about. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, neither did Matthew. And now he's three books in and going, why did I agree to do this? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sure Matthew will keep you right going, right? He really is this nuts. Well, but yeah, the, trust the me. The confusion's only going to get worse. <laughs> yeah, but it's going to get a lot worse. But I really appreciate coming on. Thank you so much for being here. You're welcome. It. We also have another member of our little steam team. Well, the good one, not the, the shitty Sharon Miller one. It is a uh, successful actor, Callum Knight. Callum? Hello, how you doing? It's good uh, to be here. I love how you just like did the mic. It's like, hello. <laughs> hello. hello. Thank, you, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> Typical actors. Sort of and presence. he's got the Elvis haircut, so he's allowed to. <laughs> yeah. Right, that, so. I know. And that's something that, I, that I've noticed. You're good looking and you're a Thomas fan. Well, we've got two good looking Thomas fans. That doesn't happen. This is like Bigfoot riding a unicorn. Exactly. Well, well thank you very much. But I mean, yeah, love Thomas. Like, um, used to rewind episodes and watch them like four times over every day. Yeah. Dirty Objects from season one, that was the, the iconic episode that I would rewind at least six times a day. Uh, um, I so. love it. He's also putting a plug for the episode so you know he really knows his stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm just showing I'm totally invested in this. You know? Yes, well, I'm <laughs> also just not the fact that I'm paying him. No, no, not at all. I mean, nope. that was just a nice addition. Do you know That's a mean? nice addition. I'll remind nice you addition. that when, for budgetary reasons, we have to get this cut. <laughs> <laughs> Fair play. Fair yeah. play. Well, since we have some newbies in, well, I'll just kind of go over the ground rules of what's going on with the show. But well, uh, well, obviously, our audience will know about this, but it's just for just for our, our new passengers. Now, I'm a massive Thomas fan, and I used to get bullied a lot because I like Thomas the Tank Engine. Like Thomas can attest to that as well. Bro, as you were getting older, they would tell you, "Oh, it's just for babies. It's just it's just for what like, Todd was. What like, what like, grow up. What like, what like, get." We'll get a real hobby, like do something like you know, normal, quote unquote. And the show didn't really help with that either. No, the, 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 no, the show getting shit didn't, didn't really help either, but uh, but I'd uh, I'd already kind of checked out by that point because I'm mm. well, spoiler alert, I'm a bit older and yeah. <laughs> but so well, because I got bullied a lot for it and just hid it all. Well, I had to hide all my uh, videos and all my yeah, all my trains. Now I realize how much they're fucking worth. I wish I could go back and slap myself. <laughs> but but yeah, when you're that age, you want to try, you're trying your best to fit in, even though you're a big fat ginger kid. Well, that wasn't going to happen anyway. <laughs> but so I got rid of it all, and I felt really guilty about it. And it wasn't until uh, an ex of mine got me. It was a, a classic Thomas Hornby train set for my birthday, and I was so happy to get it. And I was like, you know what, I'm going to keep this good. And I got kind of back into my love of Thomas again, but it felt really like a really insular hobby. I felt really alone. 
because it wasn't like, you know, social media wasn't really a thing at that point. But it was just, I was still kind of in its infancy. I felt like it was like it was like a, a dirty secret. Yeah. Well, most people have porn. Mine was Thomas. <laughs> well, I was like, I was like, I actually, I actually felt more relieved when my dad found porn under my bed than when he found my Thomas train set. It was horrible. Well, so uh, it just felt it, it was really isolating, well, and I always felt really sad. But and it wasn't until um, well, I kind of started re embracing that a bit more, and then social media started getting a bit more active. I was like, I'm gonna do a couple of wee videos on my own YouTube channel, but. Oh, top 10 best and worst Thomas engines. Why not? I'm bored. I've got nothing to do. Why not? And the response I got was unreal. I mean, you get three death threats, you know you've hit something. <laughs> <laughs> so I kept doing them. Well, and through doing these videos, I found out there was actually a really large Thomas fan community, not just like, you know, babies and toddlers, but like adults, like grown men and women like, like all around the world. Yeah. But, and when you start reading the books again, and you start watching like the early series, but there was a lot more in it for adults than there was for kids. And I just started kind of thinking to myself, I wonder what would happen if we got some normal people in who, who don't really know much about Thomas, who so know of it, but don't know the premise of like the Railway Series books, don't know about like, you know, all the stuff that like we would know about Reverend W. Audrey, like he needs um, railway accuracy and all that kind of stuff. The stuff that he was trying to do for adults to keep them invested in the stories. And I thought, well, why don't we try it? And we'll do, well, we'll read the books. Well, we'll go through, do a bit of narration. Well, and then we'll have a wee discussion afterwards well, and do a wee kind of learning segment that I got from one of the Thomas fan community, Luke Bainham, who is like the, the Irish wizard well, of, of Thomas knowledge. He knows like everything about like what type of class of engines to what, uh, when his stories were set, et cetera, et cetera. Thomas, you've, you've obviously got to know Luke as well. You know what he is like an encyclopedia. He is, he is Rain Man. He yes. is the internet. He is the internet of Thomas. He is Thomas Wicky. Yeah. He's well, Reverend reincarnated. <laughs> well, let's, let's, not, let's not insult the Reverend. <laughs> <laughs> well, and thought we could do that and then have a wee review, see what we thought of the books, and then we uh, try and establish if Thomas really is more than just a kid's show. Because the Thomas fandom think it is. Normal people think it's just for babies grow the feck up. Well, and even if it turns out that it is just uh, what the tally up and goes, oh, it's just for kids. At least maybe it's a wee bit more knowledge, a wee bit more kind of insight into the world that the Reverend W. Audrey created because this is more warm than fucking Middle Earth. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, it's crazy. So I thought, well, there's, there's only one way I'm going to get normal people to do this. Money. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So, uh, so I was getting the studio anyway. Thought, well, you're getting paid, so I'm just going to bring you in. <laughs> well, um, Fran had a holiday coming up. Sadly, now she's had to well, depart. But you, Susan, when we were talking on my show, that mental gender show, please like and subscribe. <laughs> but uh, you were talking about how when we were in the industry, getting paid work is a bit of a, it's, it's hard to get. Very much so. Well, uh, their idea of, you know, food and catering is a bottle of water for 12 hours and a mm -hmm. tap. Mm hmm but right, so I thought, well, let's get let's give Susan a paid gig, something that she can put on her on her CV. Same with Calm as well, who's just coming up in the industry. Yes. Right, and obviously Thomas as well. Right, so yeah, um, I'm gonna need a lot of funds donated, guys. But I don't <laughs> want to keep this going. I'm gonna be setting up like spread shirt and stuff as well. Just don't tell Mattel, will you? <laughs> That's a wee inside joke. And funds so we can get funds for trains as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, these are from my own collection, guys. But, and yeah, and internet before you say anything. Yes, I know Donald's buffers are missing. Don't expose your kids to it. <laughs> Fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> we would so, like to point out that this is a family show, so any <laughs> slugery charms are not permitted. <laughs> yeah. In fairness, life's unedited, so am I. And you just don't apologize for Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Well, we're, we're grown men and women talking about trains. Come on. Oh, sorry, steam engines. Sorry, look. <laughs> mm. right, so we're going to go into the fourth book of the Railway series, which is. Tank Engine Thomas again, which basically is like the one seal of titles, isn't it? It just exi says exactly what it says in the tin. But he did a book about Thomas, what the second book. Obviously, hell, you'd, you'd read that one. You never even realised that Thomas wasn't in the first book. Uh, it didn't make sense to him. I thought it was Thomas the Tank Engine. There's Thomas then. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And then we realised that, obviously, 
Thomas just became the marketable character. So yeah, it just revolved around it. And that's what happened with this wee blue tank engine. People just were like, oh, give me more Thomas. Give me more Thomas. So we went, I guess so. We'll give you another book of Thomas. It was that unique idea, wasn't it? You had something unique, you had something visual that everybody could sort of, you know, like at the minute you seen Thomas, you know, it was a straight away, you knew what you were in for. And that mm. way he didn't really need to come up with any fancy titles for, yeah. you know, future stuff. So it was yeah. all just in the stories, in the pictures. You yeah. Know? I just loved finding out that it wasn't actually the Reverend that created Thomas. It was his uh -huh. son, Christopher. No way. Well, because he did, he'd well, tried to do a model of Gordon, well, but couldn't do it from a piece of broomstick. So he made a wee tank engine. Well, and Christopher called him Thomas. So, yeah, well, Christopher really should be getting all those royalties. Yeah, <laughs> this shows you you should never discard an idea, you know what I mean? Just... Especially from a kid. Exactly. Well, because yeah. he would have only been, what, like four or five at that point. Mm -hmm. Well, my kids can barely pick their nose in their almost four. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or at this recording, there will be four. Happy birthday, boys. It's a silly you. acting exercise that my lecturer gets me to do is I uh, just write a daily page every morning, just like write thoughts down on a piece of paper. And then you come mm. back to something like that, you read something and you realise, oh, that could be like a good idea for a, a project, a play or yeah. a film, whatever, you know, it's just stuff it, like that. It's also the thing where like, even if you run out of thoughts, you just have to keep writing, I am writing, I am writing. Uh, yeah, even, <laughs> even if it is, you're just writing, I am writing. <laughs> it's nice to know some things never change in college courses, yeah, exactly. especially in exactly. the active performance side. Yeah. <laughs> and that's why so many of us fail. <laughs> no such thing as failure it just means you haven't succeeded yet there exactly. we go there we go the voice of experience yes what? Susan Sutton right there perseverance yes yeah. perseverance your there we go your motivation <laughs> of the day yeah. that's why that's why we need like, a female representation well because we'd always be like life's shit <laughs> <laughs> well she's like no it's only just a small shit <laughs> <laughs> so are we ready to roll for jumping into the tank engine thomas again ah, i'm ready to go you're ready, ready to, go. to go susan's slightly worried uh, <laughs> i'm petrified yay <laughs> <laughs> that's what we like Some mixed emotions <laughs> yep and obviously i know you guys are ready thomas is yes. the chameleon yes. the man of many voices uh, absolutely ready well, i'll be yes, interested yes. to hear all of your accents and voices as well Cal. yes i've been a uh, I've developed every accent in the world hey. <laughs> into my repertoire. Yes. I oh. lie. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm just here to just facilitate the madness. Yes. So let's dive into Tank Engine Thomas again. Dear friends, here is news from Thomas's branch line. It is clearly no ordinary line and life on it is far from dull. Thomas asks me to say that if you're ever in the region, you must be sure to visit him and travel on his line. They will have never seen anything like it, he says proudly. I know I haven't. The author. Thomas the Tank Engine is very proud of his branch line. He thinks it is the most important part of the whole railway. He has two coaches. They are old and need new paint, but he loves them very much. He calls them Annie and Clarabelle. Annie can only take passengers, but Clarabelle can take passengers, luggage, and the guard. As they run backwards and forwards along the line, Thomas sings them little songs and Annie and Clarabelle sing too. When Thomas starts from a station, he sings, Oh, come along, we're rather late. Oh, come along, we're rather late. And the coaches sing, We're, we're coming along, we're coming, coming along. They don't mind what Thomas says to them because they know he is trying to please the fat controller. And they know too that if Thomas is cross, He's not cross with them. He's cross with the engines on the main line who have made him late. One day, they had to wait for Henry's train. It was late. Thomas was getting crosser and crosser. How can I run my line properly if Henry is always late? He doesn't realise the fat controller depends on me. And he whistled impatiently. At last, Henry came. Where have you been, lazy bones? asked Thomas crossly. Oh dear, my system is out of order. No one understands my case. You don't know what I suffer, moaned Henry. Rubbish, said Thomas. You're too fat, you need exercise. Lots of people with piles of luggage got out of Henry's train and they all climbed into Annie and Clarabelle. Thomas had to wait till they were ready. At last the guard blew his whistle and Thomas started at once. The guard turned round to jump into his van, tripped over an old lady's umbrella and fell flat on his face. 
By the time he had picked himself up, Thomas and Annie and Clarabel were steaming out of the station. Come along, come along, puffed Thomas. But Clarabel didn't want to come. I've lost my nice guard. I've lost my nice guard, she sobbed. Annie tried to tell Thomas. We haven't a guard. We haven't a guard. But he was hurrying and wouldn't listen. Oh, come along. Oh, come along, he puffed impatiently. Annie and Clarabel tried to put on their brakes, but they couldn't without the guard. Where, Where is, is our guard? Where, Where is, is our guard? guard? They cried. Thomas didn't stop until they came to a signal. Oh, bother that signal, said Thomas. What's the matter? I don't know, said his driver. The guard will tell us in a minute. They waited and waited, but the guard didn't come. Peep, peep, peep. Where is the guard? Whistled Thomas. We've, We've left, left him behind, behind, sobbed Danny and Clarabel together. The driver, the fireman and the passengers looked. And there was the guard, running as fast as he could along the line, with his flags in one hand and his whistle in the other. Everybody cheered him. He was very hot, so he sat down and had a drink and told them all about it. I'm very sorry, Mr Guard, said Thomas. Well, it wasn't your fault, Thomas. It was the old lady's umbrella. Look, the signal is down. Let's make up for lost time. Annie and Clarabel were so pleased to have their guard again that they sang, As, as fast, fast as you like! As, as fast, fast as, as you like! to Thomas all the way, and they reached the end of the line quicker than ever before. Thomas's branch line had a station by the river. As he rumbled over the bridge, he would see people fishing. Sometimes they stood quietly by their lines. Sometimes they were actually jerking fish out of the water. Thomas often wanted to stay and watch, but his driver said, No, what would the fat controller say if we were late? Thomas thought it would be lovely to stop by the river. I should like to go fishing, he said to himself longingly. Every time he met another engine, he would say, I want to fish. They all answered, Engines don't go fishing. Silly stick in the muds, he would snort impatiently. Thomas generally had to take in water at the station by the river. One day he stopped as usual and his fireman put the pipe from the water tower in his tank. Then he turned the tap, but it was out of order and no water came. Bother, said Thomas. I'm thirsty. Never mind, said his driver. We'll get some water from the river. They found a bucket and some rope and went to the bridge. Then the driver let the bucket down into the water. The bucket was old and had five holes, so they had to fill it up, pull it up, and empty it into Thomas's tank as quickly as they could. There's a hole in my bucket, dear Liza, dear Liza, sang the fireman. Never mind about Liza, said the driver. You empty that bucket before you spill the water over me. They finished at last. That's good, that's good puffed Thomas as he started, and Annie and Clarabel ran happily behind. They puffed along the valley and were in the tunnel when Thomas began to feel a pain in his boiler, while steam hissed from his safety valve in, a, in an alarming way. There's too much steam, said his driver, and his fireman opened the tap in the feed pipe to let more water into the boiler, but none came. Oh dear, groaned Thomas. I'm going to burst. I'm going to burst. They damped down his fire and struggled on. I've got such a pain. I've got such a pain, Thomas hissed. Just outside the last station, they stopped, uncoupled Annie and Clarabel, and ran Thomas, who was still hissing fit to burst, on a siding right out of the way. Then, while the guard telephoned for an engine inspector and the fireman was putting out the fire, the driver wrote notices in large letters which he hung on Thomas in front and behind. Danger! Keep away! Soon the inspector and the fat controller arrived. Cheer up, Thomas! We'll soon put you right. The driver told them what had happened. So the feed pipe is blocked, said the inspector. I'll just look in the tanks. He climbed up and peered in. Then he came down. Excuse me, sir, he said to the fat controller. Please look in the tank and tell me what you see. Certainly, Inspector. He clambered up, looked in and nearly fell off in surprise. Inspector, he whispered. 
Can you see fish? Gracious goodness me, said the Fat Controller. How did the fish get there, driver? Thomas's driver scratched his head. We must have fished them from the river. And he told them about the bucket. The Fat Controller laughed. Well, Thomas, so you and your driver have been fishing, but fish don't suit you. We must get them out. So the driver and the fireman fetched rods and nets, and they all took turns at fishing in Thomas's tank, while the Fat Controller told them how to do it. When they had caught all the fish, the station master gave them some potatoes. The driver borrowed a frying pan, while the fireman made a fire beside the line and did the cooking. Then they all had a lovely picnic supper of fish and chips. That was good, said the Fat Controller as he finished his share. But fish don't suit you, Thomas, so you mustn't do it again. No, sir, I won't, said Thomas sadly. Engines don't go fishing. It's too uncomfortable. Autumn was changing the leaves from green to brown. The fields were changing too, from yellow stubble to brown earth. As Thomas puffed along, he heard the chug, chug, chug of a tractor at work. One day, stopping for a signal, he saw a tractor close by. Hello, said the tractor. I'm Terence. I'm ploughing. I'm Thomas. I'm pulling a train. What ugly wheels you've got. They are not ugly. They are caterpillars, said Terence. I can't go anywhere. I don't need rails. I don't want to go anywhere, said Thomas happily. I like my rails. Thank you. Thomas often saw Terence working. But though he whistled, Terence never answered. Winter came, and with it dark, heavy clouds full of snow. I don't like it, said Thomas's driver. A heavy fall is coming. I hope it doesn't stop us. Oh, said Thomas, seeing the snow melt on the rails. Soft stuff, nothing to it. And he puffed on, feeling cold but confident. They finished their journey safely, but the country was covered and the rails were two dark lines standing out in the white snow. You'll need your snowplow for the next journey, Thomas, said his driver. Pooh! Snow is silly soft stuff. It won't stop me. Listen to me, his driver replied. We are going to fix your snowplow on, and I want no nonsense, please. The snowplow was heavy and uncomfortable and made Thomas cross. He shook it and banged it, and when they got back, it was so damaged that the driver had to take it off. You're a very naughty engine, said his driver as he shut the shed door that night. Next morning, both driver and fireman came early, worked hard to mend the snowplow, but they couldn't make it fit properly. It was time for the first train. Thomas was pleased. I shan't have to wear it. I shan't have to wear it, he puffed to Annie and Clarabelle. I hope it's all right. I, I hope, hope it's all right. right. They whispered anxiously to each other. The driver was anxious too. It's not too bad here, he said to the fireman. But it's sure to be deep in the valley. It was snowing again when Thomas started, but the rails were not covered. Silly soft stuff. Silly soft stuff, he puffed. I didn't need that stupid old thing yesterday, and I shan't today. Snow can't stop me. And he rushed into the tunnel, thinking how clever he was. At the other end, he saw a heap of snow fallen from the sides of the cutting. Hmm, silly old snow, said Thomas, and charged it. Cinders and ashes, said Thomas. I'm stuck. And he was. Back, Thomas, back, said his driver. Thomas tried, but his wheels spun and he couldn't move. More snow fell and piled up around him. The guard went back for help, while the driver, fireman and passengers tried to dig the snow away. But as fast as they dug, more snow slipped down until Thomas was nearly buried. Oh, my wheels and coupling rods, said Thomas sadly. I shall have to stop here till I'm frozen. What a silly engine I am. And Thomas began to cry. At last, a tooting in the distance told them a bus had come for the passengers. Then Terence choked through the tunnel. He pulled the empty coaches away and came back for Thomas. Thomas's wheels were clear, but still spun helplessly as he tried to move. Terence tugged and slipped and slipped and tugged 
and at last dragged Thomas into the tunnel. Thank you, Terence. Your caterpillars are splendid, said Thomas gratefully. I hope you'll be sensible now, Thomas, said his driver severely. I'll try, said Thomas, as he puffed home. One day, Thomas was waiting at the junction when a bus came into the yard. Hello, said Thomas. Who are you? I'm Bertie. Who are you? I'm Thomas. I run this line. So you're Thomas. Ah, I remember now. You stuck in the snow. I took your passengers and Terence pulled you out. I've come to help you with your passengers today. Help me, said Thomas crossly, going bluer than ever and letting off steam. I can go faster than you. You can't. I can. I'll race you, said Bertie. Their drivers agreed. The station master said, Are you ready? Go. And they were off. Thomas never could go fast at first, and Bertie drew in front. Thomas was running well, but he did not hurry. Why, Why don't, don't you go, go fast? fast? Why, Why don't, don't you go, go fast? fast? Called Annie and Clarabel anxiously. Wait and see. Wait and see. Hissed Thomas. He's, He's a, a long, long way ahead. ahead. He's, He's a long way ahead. ahead. They wailed, but Thomas didn't mind. He remembered the level crossing. There was Bertie, fuming at the gates while they sailed gaily through. <laughs> Goodbye, Bertie, said Thomas. The road left the railway and went through a village, so they couldn't see Bertie. They stopped at the station. Peep, 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 quickly, please, called Thomas. Everybody got out quickly. The guard whistled and off they went. Come along, come along, sang Thomas. We're, We're coming, coming along. along! We're coming along! sang Annie and Clarabel. Hurry, hurry, hurry! panted Thomas, looking straight ahead. Then he whistled shrilly in horror, for Bertie was crossing the bridge over the railway, tooting triumphantly on his horn. Oh, dearie me! Oh, dearie me! groaned Thomas. He's, He's a, a long way in front! front. A, a long way in front! front wailed Annie and Clarabel. Steady, Thomas, said his driver. We'll beat Bertie yet. We'll beat Bertie yet. We'll beat Bertie yet. Echoed Annie and Clarabel. We'll do it. We'll do it. Panted Thomas bravely. Oh, bother. There's a station. As he stopped, he heard a toot. Goodbye, Thomas. You must be tired. Sorry I can't stop. We buses have to work, you know. Goodbye. The next station was by the river. They got there quickly, but the signal was up. Oh, dear thought Thomas. We've lost. But he felt better after a drink. Then James rattled through with a goods train and the signal dropped, showing the line was clear. Hurrah, we're off! Hurrah, we're off! puffed Thomas gaily. As they rumbled over the bridge, they heard an impatient toot toot. And there was Bertie, waiting at the red light while cars and lorries crossed the narrow bridge in the opposite direction. Road and railway ran up the valley side by side a stream tumbling between them. Thomas had not crossed the bridge when Bertie started with a roar and soon shot ahead. Excited passengers in train and bus cheered and shouted across the valley. Now Thomas reached his full speed and foot by foot, yard by yard, he gained till they were running level. Bertie tried hard, but Thomas was too fast. Slowly but surely he drew ahead, till, whistling triumphantly, he plunged into the tunnel, leaving Bertie toiling far behind. I've done it! I've done it! panted Thomas in the tunnel. We've done it! Hooray! We've done it! Hooray! chanted Annie and Clarabel, and, whistling proudly, they whooshed out of the tunnel into the last station. The passengers gave Thomas three cheers and told the station master and the porters all about the race. When Bertie came in, they gave him three cheers too. Well done, Thomas, said Bertie. That was fun, but to beat you over that hill, I should have to grow wings and be an aeroplane. Thomas and Bertie now keep each other very busy. Bertie finds people in the villages who want to go by train and takes them to Thomas, while Thomas brings people to the station for Bertie to take home. They often talk about their race, but Bertie's passengers don't like being bounced like peas in a frying pan and the fat control has warned Thomas about what happens to engines who race at dangerous speeds. So although, between you and me, they would like to have another race, I don't think they ever will. 
So that was Tank Engine Thomas again, the fourth book of the Railway series. Now what we'll do is we will get the opinions on the books from both the Normie side, which is Matthew <laughs> and Susan, and the Thomas side, which is Calum and Thomas. And as usual, we'll start off with the Normies. So, what did you think of the book? Uh, Thomas and uh, which one was it again? <laughs> <laughs> you can tell us. I, I, I think that I think that sums up. Are you talking about the, Tom, the Tom Tank Engine Thomas again? Yeah, but then there's like the four books inside that, isn't there? Yeah, there's so four we stories. Uh, we're on. Yeah, well, I've mentioned the book, and there's four stories in the book. So we talk about the book, and, the book you, talk about any, and you talk about the book as a whole. Any stories? Uh, the, You've the, been around for three right, of right, these. Right, you right, should right, fucking right, know. Right, <laughs> it's because I'm like looking at this, and this is a different one. The nerds are going to be so pissed off right now. Hey, well, you, you can cut this. No, um, no, definitely not. I'm already featured in enough of the blooper reel. That should be my main star role. Just bloopers. Um, <laughs> no, I think I, I think it wasn't quite as um, adult themed as some of the previous books. Like the previous books, as I say, we're kind of talking about maybe some darker themes. Yeah, and well. I think these still have good morals in them, but I don't know if they're as like dark or you know they're not talking about the private privatization of the railway and things yeah. like that. <laughs> yeah, or, or um, essentially breaking up engines and leaving. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's <laughs> yeah. not quite as dark as all that. Um, it still has a wee bit of that, do you know what I mean? There's like a, a wee bit in all the books so far where there's like a kind of, almost like a school kind of mentality of laughing at people's misfortune and stuff like that. <laughs> so like when the guard trips up in the umbrella and stuff like that, there's kind of, if you get with that kind of slapstick yeah. kind of uh, humour, um, which is maybe like a little kind of dark note to it sometimes, do you know what I mean? Because mm. maybe nowadays we would, we would think of some of that as like bullying and, and things like that. Um, yeah, yeah, everything's cancel culture these days. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and I guess maybe people are maybe people are more sensitive or it's just a different world or whatever back then. Um, but I still don't feel like they're as dark as like yeah, getting bricked up in a tunnel and left to, <laughs> to rot. Yeah, um, mm. that that's pretty like grim for a, a kid to be yeah. hearing. Yeah, pretty... But I think these are more in line with what a, a kid might be expecting from yeah, yeah. Most, like a... most kids' media, do you know what I mean? There's like kind of a moral to the stories and a, a, a like a you know like a fable that has a, a meaning behind it or whatever. Mm. Um, but I don't think it's quite as. Um, Layered, if that makes sense. Do you know what I mean? Where before there was like, there's like the kids' interpretation of it, and then the adult interpretation. You see, we be a bit more like on the money, if that makes sense. Yeah, straight down the line. Hey, <laughs> hey. we got a good Thomas joke in there. <laughs> right, well, Susan, you were doing a bit more of the narration, and aside from double entendres what, uh, that you were laughing, that you were laughing at in the outtakes. What did you think of the the stories? What from? From reading it. Well, it's not my fault that there were double entendres in there. That's down to the writer. Um, yeah, the, the poor reverend had no, well, would have had no idea about any of that, what that we were interpreting, what, you know, chugging in our 21st century analogies. Yeah, put, put him, slipping the pipe into, into the tanks and things like that. Yeah. I mean, for, for that, for adults reading it, definitely there's, um, there's a lot of double entendre in there. Yeah. Absolutely. But I've just got a mucky mind anyway. Uh, yeah, in fairness, you get, well, life just corrupts you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. no, I corrupt life. Yeah. But what do you think <laughs> of the stories in general? Um, I mean, I like the stories. Um, you know, going back years to the, the originals and everything else, it, it, was, it was for kids. But I think as you get older, you can see a lot more meaning in the stories. Now, I haven't haven't read the previous ones that you were talking about. Um, I think breaking a train up in a shed is really cruel. Uh, breaking them up in the tunnel and just, tunnel. Leaving, just leaving them to die. Why, why did it? they do that? Because he didn't like the rain. He didn't like the rain, so they just went, OK, right, rain coming out, you die. So, <laughs> so they couldn't think about putting them under a, a canopy or something yeah. like that. And well, that was, that was why they wrote the fourth story, so they could have a resolution for it, because they thought, well, it's, this is too dark. Well, we need to actually give him a, a redemption. It was because he was being a, a diva. Eh? Yeah, he was being... Gen- he wanted to. He was, he was being the general... Rain. Everybody else is out of the rain, so you can get you can stay in then and, and get locked away away yeah. from everybody else. He was basically being the Jennifer Lopez of steam engines, except we don't <laughs> want Jennifer Lopez back out. <laughs> That's just cruel. Yeah. But I, I enjoyed reading it. Um... 
and listening to the different engines and the carriages, Annie and Clarabelle. Yep. Yes, not Anna and Clarabelle. <laughs> yes, yes. That's in the outtake. Yeah, in fairness, like, uh, like the coaches were like the only like female representation at this point, and that kind of shows the the mentality of the time because it was well, it was back in the nineteen like forties, nineteen fifties that these were wrote. Well, there you go. It was very, it was very kind of sexist. That, yeah, you know, yeah. like the female ones were always the submissive coaches. Yeah, they what? and and mm. behind the male. Yeah. Well, I think Annie and Clarabelle, or a new engine, female engine, should come to the fore. Well, don't worry. Like we'll get them later on in the books if you're if you're still around for that point. <laughs> if you, if you, Am if you... I sacked already? No, <laughs> no it's just more if you think no, nah, no, nah, that's <laughs> broken. I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> right. So we'll pass over to our, our Thomas fans. Right. What? In all honesty, what do you think of this book? Uh honestly, like I still like these stories because they're well, they're simple enough to follow. But it's also like, as well, I think with these stories, it's still very much early days, so we're still getting to know everybody. So I think that's why the story's kind of kept at a sort of standard level. Because we, I mean, okay, yes, we do know Thomas because we had that one book with him, but we've not seen him for a while. Mm -hmm. So it's like just reestablishing the character for a wee bit. Yeah, and obviously there was enough clamour for him what, that they had to do another book <clears throat> about it. So clearly his, his story had made an impression on the fan base. and. Mm -hmm. What, and he would have went by like the fan base like all his kids oh yeah because that's who he always consulted he always consulted his uh, his children and, what, and if they didn't like it or if, they, or if something didn't make sense to them he would go back and rewrite it because it had to make not only make sense for the kids but it also had to be bearable enough that, they, that the adults who were reading the stories wouldn't be like nah chucking it away <laughs> well, so it wouldn't, so it wouldn't wind up like a, a Paw Patrol with nowadays, where it's just it's so saturated and just so dumbed down. You're like, nah, uh, I'm out, I'm out, I'm done. Yeah, I think despite it being these stories being quite simplistic and quite child friendly, in my opinion, um, at the same time it isn't like dumbed down, like you say, and there is like subtle hints of kind of moral teachings, I guess, in there, like with mm. the Bertie race when Thomas, like at the end, you know. Um, it's so originally it's like kind of showing this competition and encouraging children, I guess, to be ambitious and compete and you know take part in competitions and stuff. But then at the end, Bertie's very nice about the fact that Thomas yeah. wins. He was a gracious loser, which is something I'm still exactly. trying to teach my fucking kids about. And it's just kind of you know teaches that kind of good sportsmanship thing, I guess. Yeah. Thing doesn't it? You know. And it also brings it back with the realism because yeah. that that is real. That was really deadly to do. Why? Yeah. Because if you imagine like. He would have been hitting maybe what like a hundred mile an hour. Yeah. Uh, well, something like that. Thomas, what the the tank engines could go about well, one hundred and twenty or something like that. Something like that, yeah. Well, yeah. they were so they were so they're, if they're both like what like, pushing, pushing, pushing. But well, one slap and that if that was done when it was like Thomas and Terence with the yeah. snow, they'd all be dead. Yeah. yeah. I think. I think. Well, some... So so you get the warning at the end. Go and look. Yeah. This is what happens if you race at dangerous speeds again. We had yeah. that with James in the second book, as you remember. Like you know the brake blocks went on fire and just like straight off into a field so yeah. it doesn't shy away from the fact that these are real engines and real trains and there is uh -huh. there is consequences yeah but i like the book because it's the first book where they actually introduce non-railway characters yeah up to this point it's always been it's been henry gordon edward thomas james have all been railway based you know, coaches trucks this is the first ones where you've got like a bus or you've yeah. got a tractor a tractor and it's a and it's a very unusual tractor like for mm -hmm. you know anybody that would be looking at them now because they'd be like, What's this thing? This doesn't look like a, a Massey Ferguson. Doesn't, yeah. doesn't look <laughs> what well, I only know that because I also work on a farm. <laughs> I think another nice thing with Terence with uh, Thomas Terence in the snow is it also teaches kids don't judge by appearances because like because actually obviously Thomas is like at the start, like, oh you can't be useful because you look weird. And yeah. so and then when mm. Terence actually mm. helps him out of the snow, it's like he goes like Oh, actually, you're not so bad after all. So it kind of shoots kids, don't judge someone until yeah. you get to know them. Yeah, pretty much. Because he, he just flat out calls them ugly. I know, I know. <laughs> he, just say, he just says, like, you're you're ugly because, like, your, your real things look different. And he's like, no, I can go anywhere with these. Like, and, like, he's secure He's secure enough to be like, I can do my job and I'm good at it. And it's like, I can go anywhere. And he's like, oh, I'm superior than you because I am a train. And then, you know, he crashes into snow and he can't get out. Yeah, uh -huh. and I don't think I don't think these stories are trying to really 
push, like a moral message. It's almost like subtly ingrained in the story, and it mm -hmm. kind of just ends up in the the, ch the child's subconscious, and it's just kind of yeah. there through storytelling. And I think, like you were saying, when they were introducing the bus and the tractor, I think um, the reason why these stories maybe seem seem more kid friendly is that they were very very visual with the new like off off track elements and stuff. So I think mm -hmm. it was about the kids being really engaged in what's happening on the screen rather than so much about the dialogue. It was a, a, bit, a lot more about like the actual actions, I think, for these stories in particular. Well, let's, let's talk about the illustrations and talk about like, yep. the drawings and stuff. Like, yep. So we know it from, you know, we, we're, we're the nerds. We, yeah. we, we know about all these. Like We have, we notice the colours, we notice the styles that are coming through, yep. like, and how like, um, Dobby's like developing the world and developing like the kind of more greenery elements and off road stuff. But what did uh, what did the normies think what of it? I mean, you've had a couple now, Matthew. You've seen the kind of the illustrative style. Mm -hmm. Is it still? Do you, have you noticed any kind of changes from it? Like maybe is that more of a an established style is starting to be imprinted now that Dobby's finally doing it on his own. I guess yeah, maybe it's a bit more consistent. I don't know if I've noticed that if you haven't mentioned it though. Mm. But yeah, they like you know, we're looking at the book just now. Yeah, but you can see it's a bit more consistent. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Um, but I think as you mentioned, it's kind of, as Thomas mentioned, it's kind of early days for the for mm -hmm. the business, so they're still establishing characters. Yeah, uh, maybe still establishing exactly how they want things to look. Um, as, as well, you know, you know, there's probably an element there, of, like response, if that makes sense. Yeah. Depending on what books have been responded to better, I imagine probably kind of led, led them in a certain direction. Yeah, but so, it's, it's, it's a classic, still, it's classic Thomas Tank Engine thing. You know what I mean? Although mm -hmm. I'm they're never a massive fan of anything like that, the <clears> Thomas <throat> himself is just kind of iconic. Mm -hmm. um, do I? I, 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 don't, I? I think I can see a bit more consistency, but. Yeah. Something that I found it's quite probably stuff I'm not noticing. Yeah. <clears throat> well, one thing that I'll point out is that they're doing they're starting to bring in real life elements because if you look in the Thomas and the Guard illustration, but at this point here in the newsstand, he's actually advertising his previous book, James the Red Engine. Mm -hmm. Which is quite uh, which is him bringing in some of his mm -hmm. yeah, his meta deadpool. Mm -hmm. go, like, he's bringing the real world and elements new, in. And also the newsstand as well says so all about Thomas the Grand Tank Engine. Exactly. So he's bringing in like real work. So he's starting to work in his real world elements, mm -hmm. which is what she became famous for. So what about yourself, Susan? Would you, would being new to like the illustrative style and all the kind of the artwork, what's your impressions of it? Um, I'm going to sneeze. <laughs> <laughs> That's the impression. Bless you. That was a very good impression. Like, oh. <laughs> Bless you. Oh, Thank you. Oh, choose a kiss, call that one in. Oh, so choose a kiss. <laughs> Here we are. <laughs> um, yeah, I like the illustrations. Um, oh, my stomach. <laughs> <laughs> she needs food to people. Mm. Yeah, well, we won't be long. Right, I do like the illustrations. Um, I, I like the style. It's very simplistic. But like you say, it is quite involved. It's the, the newspaper stand and everything else we, for the previous and... Previous books, um, the the pictures draw you in to look at more detail. It's not just the pictures, not just the drawings of the trains. There's, there's all kinds of little details. Mm. It was something that Audrey was really what well, uh, pernickety about. Everything had to be accurate. It had to be. They had to have a lot of detail with it. Why? Well, because kids are one of the most like nitpicky audiences that you mm. can have. If kids pick up on something that isn't right, they're going to call it out. Oh, yeah. Straight, like, straight away. Well, I mean, we were even like that. Well, I, I didn't read the stories properly until I was a teenager. I knew it more from the TV show. Yeah. TV show. But even I was like, well, that doesn't, that looks different from what it is in the TV show. Mm. What, you, what, they're, in, they're inquisitive. They'll know about these type of things. Even the dialogue mm. as well. Like some of the dialogues extended from what they did for the actual TV version of the story yeah. as well. Yeah, definitely. You'd notice slight differences from that. I think a great thing to notice about the illustrations as well is it's not literally just a snapshot of um, something random. There's actually like a relevant or important like like situation happening in every photo. Yeah, you know I mean, like, it's complementing yeah, like, what the story is telling essentially. Yeah, like like, like the like um, the Thomas and Dorothy <clears throat> ones. Like they don't just say 
oh, what, um, to, you don't just say Thomas and Bertie are racing at a river, what, and they can see and they can see each other, and you're just seeing a picture of Thomas. You're actually seeing Thomas and Bertie. You're seeing the river. Well, where they're racing, you're seeing that Thomas is edging ahead. Yes, a, a well, direct relationship with mm -hmm. the story. Aye, with the narrative. With the words. Yeah. yeah, because the small books as well used to do that as well. Like, like mm. on every page where there was like sort of a key element, that would be what the picture is for that page as well. So like, yeah. for Bertie racing over the bridge on that page would be them actually showing it. Yeah, and those smaller books, that, that was the first what, in that type of media where they would have a picture at one side and the story or, what, on what, the other side. Well, I was a first for doing, doing yeah. it back, uh, back in the day, so it was quite inventive. Uh -huh. You're getting a lot of the senses as well embedded mm. in, the, in the illustrations, you know, you're mm. getting um, like speed, uh, this, the, like, there was ones with pictures of cows in it, so you're getting like, you can imagine like the smell of a farm, yeah. and then there's like the... Yeah, and even the Thomas Goes Fishing here, as well, like you know, you're getting yeah, that the, the, the engine can feel pain. Yes, uh, as well. Yes. Why, why he's basically essentially he's got trapped in. Yeah. <laughs> Is it, what, uh, just, just on the theme of um, as well about it being like for adults. Although like we kind of say like the pictures are simplistic, the arm, the arm, like you say, there's a lot of detail in them. Mm. They're quite picturesque as well, mm -hmm. and, and it's almost like kind of like like what I think of like class old old landscape paintings and yeah. stuff like yep. that. There's a great nostalgia to it now. So it's almost like yeah, it's done for kids, but it's not kidded if that makes sense mm -hmm. it's not like they, they they want it to be the same level of quality as an adult would expect from yeah. a piece of art or something like that yep. yeah um you touched on it before like when we were doing like the, what the first one like everything's so sleek and so mm -hmm. stylized in media these days like with books and what and all that kind of mm -hmm. stuff there's not really any margin so, for so, error so kind of hard lines and yeah flat bold, bold colors yeah, uh -huh. yeah. We're, kind of like just flat, like flat, flat yeah. like almost like um, yeah. just like vector graphics. Yeah, whereas you know? when you look at yeah. books it's like, like this, you can see the headers. Like, when you can see the hills in the background, yeah. that adds this real sense of depth and like vastness and stuff. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Contrast yeah. and like, you know, like the shine on the engines and stuff and you can yeah, see like, like scratches and... So obviously the engines are yeah. like primary also, colours and yeah, stuff. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. But then they're not, you know, it's not just like block blue, like as you say, there's shading and stuff being done. It's, you know, given it this kind of and also, yeah, space and lighting yeah. and everything. No, it's actually like the first time I've really noticed that Thomas is just primary colours. Mm. Yeah. Because he's, yeah. he's, he's blue, blue he's, got, he's got a yellow one and he's got red buffers. Mm. Uh, but I do think... Fuck, I, I just picked that up when I'm 35. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And also as well, the nice thing as well with the drawings as well, if they're like racing as when in Thomas and Bertie, like you can see like the yeah. sort of white streaks for yeah, yeah, you know, show for speed, the yeah. show how fast they're going. Well. I, do, I, do I just feel like oh, sorry. No, um, no. Uh, I definitely do think, like you were saying, like adults will appreciate the effort that goes into the artwork for the children. Mm -hmm. I think the uh, craft, craftsmanship. Yes, the craftsmanship. Just think of, like more modern, like you know, if you watch some cartoons on TV or something like that, I don't think the artwork is going to be as like detailed and high quality mm -hmm. as that. Uh, it's what well, modern stuff is always what well, high quality because they've got the technology to do it. But everybody, well, well, it's I mean, everybody it does see it. Dep depends what you call yeah. quality, isn't it? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. Well, it's it's mm -hmm. everybody's interpretation. Whereas to me, this is quality because it's not perfect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, and that's the way it should be. So like, someone's taking like it's like it's like you go, oh, his face is these. his face uh, is grey there, but his face is a slightly lighter mm -hmm. shade of grey there. But these are little things that. You know, it would all be consistent across the board. Uh, yeah. But with 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 modern media, and yeah. modern like. But life isn't perfect. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, with with animation these days, it's all like you know completely perfect. Mm. Yeah. There is no like contrast or yeah. um you know like, hard edges. You know, it's just all, you know, yeah. you know what I mean. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. And one thing that always makes like Thomas really good is like finding out a bit of the backstories of where this came from. So I think this is probably a good time to jump into the learning with Luke segment. For the, the newbies that have joined us, this is where we get the Thomas Wiki, as I call him, while yeah. Luke Bainham has provided me with some uh, real life information that's based around the stories and based around the books. Well, so I took a couple of notes, well, and what well, you know, the, main, the main things that kind of really struck me. So, one of them is that um, the story of Thomas and Bertie. It wasn't actually originally intended to be a story, it was, it was invented as a board game for his kids. Well, and to amuse them while he was he took his kids on holiday to Wales, but they liked it, but so it got adapted into a story. And the reason that the Farquhar branch line was created was so that the race between Thomas and Bertie was deemed, you know, a fair race, but by the children, since both characters would have the same amount of obstacles to overcome, like they would have 
you know, Bertie stopping at traffic lights, like um, Thomas would be a slow starter, all that kind of stuff, which was really interesting to find out about. Imagine what a Thomas and Bertie board game would have been like. Mm. That would have been exactly. mental. That would have actually been quite fun, to be honest. Yeah. My kids would have beat each other senseless. Yeah, I've got, I've got <laughs> really, you know, like the old Skeletrics. Oh, yeah. 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 They go too fast and they just shoot <laughs> off the track. Yeah. <laughs> into some vase. And again, like I was saying, like reading the stories to his children, what like became a trend, because he would use them as his test audience. Mm. Like, so if the kids didn't like what it was, he would go back, he would rewrite it, like, and then read it again until the kids went, yeah, I like it. <laughs> Which makes sense, that's your market, that's your target audience was the kids. But at the same time, it had to be relatable so that he would be able to read it back and go, yeah, I like this. Because he's not just writing it for the kids, he's writing it for the parents who have to read these stories 10 times over to the kids as a parent and as a parent. We can attest to that. <laughs> yeah. I guess that's a consideration, isn't it? Like yeah. um, how easy is this story to tell? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. How easy is it to imagine? Um, yeah. Especially for adults who have to try and bring that world to life for the children. Yeah. yeah. And there's a lot of like stories were based on real events. The one that I never thought was really based on a real event was Thomas Goes Fishing. And I thought, that can't even be based on something real. Mm-hmm. And yes, it is based on a real life event that happened in Glasgow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, on the Glasgow and Southern Western Railway, or the GSWR as it was called. But mm-hmm. well, the driver kept fish in the water tank and it was supposedly to keep the tank clean. And that policy ran from 1850 until 1923 and became part of the London, Midland and Scottish Railway, which is quite interesting. Mm-hmm. Well, and as I said before, like an illustration of what James the Red Engine's advertisement was brought up in Thomas and the Guard to try and bring the realism back to it. Mm-hmm. Well, and well, Thomas and the Guard, for timeline continuity, was t- took place in 1925. Thomas Thomas in the Snow was in 1947. Thomas and Bertie in 1948. And there's, what, well, surprisingly no date for Thomas Goes Fish. Well, it's marked as an mm. unknown. I think probably because that was a running policy for so long that they were just like, I'll just throw that in the middle. <laughs> it's just a, just, a, just a random one. But I found it so weird that out of all the stories that uh, you could you would think would be true, that the fish <laughs> is the one that was, <laughs> that was true. Yeah, but, yeah, and of course it had to happen on a Glasgow line, didn't it? Yeah, typical. <laughs> Unreal. I like our fish shoppers up here in Glasgow. <laughs> I know. That's something never ran through to me. Like, he, well, he basically like he takes the fish out in the book, got scales and cooks it, well, and then they eat it. But there, how is that? What like that's no health and safety inspector yeah. there. Well, it can it's, be done. It's been but swimming in a tank for ages, like, and they're saying that it's still the fish are still alive. I thought it would have boiled. But when, it's, when it's half cooked. Yeah. Well, in fairness, there was no water going into tanks, so it wouldn't really have hit it just got a that much. Tropical yeah. fish. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's just so it's just so interesting of all the stories to be true. The one about fish. Know, what is it that. with Thomas and fish? Mm. Well, this is a running thing that happens late, that later on with fish. Yeah. Well, uh, at least it's not Thomas who then has a problem with fish after this. Well, we'll f- we'll find out as we go. <laughs> So now we're going to come to the final segment of the show, and that is where we give Tank Engine Thomas again a yay or nay rating. Now we're actually changing it up a little bit because beforehand we had Matthew and we had Fran. They would go away, they would discuss it, what the stories, and discuss where they thought it was acceptable what for what kids and adults, what they would come back and they would have reached decision and would have came up with. Well, so far, uh, Dobby Era is 2-1 up for the yay column rather than the nay. But because we have an even playing field this time, I thought we should get the normies perspective where they think that the Thomas media books well, could be appreciated by adults. We get the Thomas fans perspective. And in the event that it comes to a tie, I will be the main adjudicator and make the final decision. And I'll have to take all my bias of Thomas out, out of the way and give a fair and honest answer. And that way it saves them getting the hate. <laughs> so we'll start off with Susan and Matthew. But would you give Tank Engine Thomas a game, a yay or a nay? Thumbs up or thumbs down? What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and that, that's the question is, is it suitable for adults as well as kids yes can it can it be in, enjoyed by people of all ages 
I think so. Yeah. I think um, there's still, although I kind of said that it was a bit more straightforward maybe than some of the other ones, and um, I still think there's bits there for like adults to think about and stuff like that. If they're reading to their kids, there's going to be things that they're going to take from it that the kids won't necessarily take from it. Mm -hmm. So in that essence, there's definitely a part of it there that maybe even can only be appreciated by adults. That, that's what I was thinking, that adults you know, as they're reading it, they can also take something from this, even though it may not be sort of in your face. Kids being kids want a story read to them over and over again. Mm -hmm. So I think eventually adults would definitely learn things by this, like the race between Bertie and Thomas. Mm -hmm. You know, and then the kids kids are in the, the family's out in the car, going to drive somewhere, and the kids can turn around and say, Daddy, do you remember the mm -hmm. Thomas the Tank Engine book? You're going a bit fast. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and if they also if they're driving, why well, they see a train next to them, they're like, race that train, <laughs> let's, race, let's race that train. But then it's down down to the the driving adults, the responsible yeah. one, to say, yeah, it was in the book, but we can't really yeah. do it in real life. Well, so just, yeah, it's it's, it's like, like remember the warning about peas in a frying pan. Yeah. <laughs> so the, I, I think a yay. A yay. Like a yay yeah. Mm. Oh, we are one now up to the yay column. So now we jump to the Thomas fans side. Would you give Tank Engine Thomas again a yay or a nay? What do you think, Thomas? You're the most, you're the expert here. Now, if anything, I... that maybe puts Thomas to a disadvantage because so. he, cause he might just go, yay! Yeah. <laughs> because he's a Thomas fan, but well, you've got a bit more, more normie experience. I guess so. I'm kind of that kind of middle ground. That, that. Yeah, you're the I mean, wild card I'm on the a, Thomas I'm fandom a, side. I'm in a toss up, like at the same time, like I totally um, am on board with what was said about how adults could totally find value in it and using it to, you know, for, for parental reasons and just for appreciating the effort and art that goes into making these stories. But I do think, particularly, these stories that we read are um, less heavy on the sort of political and moral elements and are just very much about visual storytelling and you know they are simplistic and it is about just engaging the kids with what they're kind of imagining and the pictures that they're seeing you know what i mean mm -hmm. i don't think the dialogue is overly filled with like subtle political or moral information i think there is little things in there but i don't think it's top heavy with it so um, so you're, I'm in a so you're leaning more to towards nay. the nay side, I think. I'm maybe leaning towards the nay side, but I'll let um, Thomas input and we'll see. In fairness, I do kind of agree with what Calum says a wee bit, but at the same time, it's like, I think I can enjoy this book because, yes, the stories might be a bit simple, but they're still readable for adults as well, mm -hmm. and as well as kids. So, I don't know, I think we're a yay, to be honest, because... There's a split in the Thomas camp. This, is, split. this is definitely <laughs> interesting. I do, I do think some of the future stories um, do kind of go down a more complex route um, mm. compared to these ones. You think that's why more Thomas fans gravitate to the, the older books, so to speak, because it because it goes down that route? Because because the books grew up with the audience. They were wrote over 27 years. So yeah. the kids that had the first one read them as kids were adults reading these stories to their kids. Yes. Yeah, because I kind of agree with that as well. Because like as because I think after this book, this was like sort of the last of the sort of let's get everyone introduced book because obviously, yes, we have more characters coming along with the rest of the books as they go on. But I do think as well, this is like the last of the sort of getting to know you episodes pretty much. Yeah. Because then the rest of the books now, I think, are more like actual stories for characters we've already met, plus also while introducing new characters at the same time. So I do think that's probably why they more gravitate to this, but I think this is like a act a nice little end to the getting to know you phase of the books. Yeah, I, I can I can agree with that as well. And I think um, just a, just like a thought that keeps going through my head is like, is there a reason that an adult would pick up this book purely for their own gain or purely for their own thoughts or for whatever reason? But I think it always kind of falls back to the young person, doesn't it? Like if they're mm -hmm. going to pick up this book, they're going to be they're doing it, I guess, to read it to their child or to you know. I don't. I mean, I could be wrong. I mean, as as do you think, like everybody's opinion you know, is different. Every, every they're... perspectives legit. So... Because maybe maybe adults would genuinely be, because especially creatives, you know, they might be interested in picking up, um, like children's books and trying to invest themselves in how they're written and how they're made, so that they can then do the same thing. So I guess there's mm -hmm. that element to it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. So I think what I'm getting from both of you is this is a me. 
Do you think? I'm, I think I'm if gonna. If you're thinking by think, the by the guides of the uh, could adults appreciate this? Mm. By appreciate by appreciate, you mean like I I guess like. So if I say nay, does that mean that adults don't like it altogether? Like uh, it's a, more a case disregard. of like an adult wouldn't wouldn't pick up the book, why just kind of for their own. Oh, I fancy I'd, reading this. I I think adults will more read this for the nostalgia because obviously if the adults grew up with this when they were kids, I think that would be the reason they'd probably pick this up. To be honest, is yeah. for nostalgia purposes. I think that, that could be a reason, but I think there's, there's probably maybe a, a minority of that in my opinion. So mm. I think I'm going to go with nay. Yeah, yeah. I'll actually have to agree with you on this one, Calma. I think I'll go with nay as well. So the first, do, do, do so the first one. Okay. Well, it says it says P, but it looks like it looks like it's a nay in the Thomas yeah. side, okay. which is interesting. Okay. So it falls down to me, the final adjudicating side, taking both arguments into consideration, well, and then trying to put my own personal bias out of the way. I have to agree with Cal and Thomas. Ooh. Because <sighs> it's. <laughs> I, I will be perfectly honest I'm not a fan of this book I'm mm. not well, it's, it's in the title it's Tank Engine Thomas again it's like it's just it's purely there for, mar for, for like a market thing it's there because oh kids want to see hear more okay we give them some extra stories and if you look at the second book of Thomas he had a full character arc in that he went from being like the cocky little prick mm. like, and then getting his then getting his comeuppance and then learning from it and growing and from that hard work and changing his ways, he got the branch thing as a result. So these books always, these stories felt like filler. It was just like, oh, what's he been up to? We'll just add these ones in. And if you look at the later books, Thomas isn't really as featured, much. What featured much. So he said what he needed to say about Thomas and, it, and was only really having to put him in. As or, a side character. As a side character. What, and... We all know the infamous Thomas the Tank Engine documentary where he slates Brett Allcroft and all the ones that do the TV show because well, they were obsessed with the popularity of Thomas that they were putting into a story, whether the story ever required him or not. Uh, it was just purely, there's Thomas, he's got to be in almost every episode. Wasn't the former of Britain that used the, that Thomas had to usually be in at least at some point during the opening episode yeah. of a season? Yeah, he always had to be there or thereabouts. It was like Hitchcock. Mm -hmm. yeah. It always had to be in some yeah. way. Yeah, and it's because like purely Thomas is the marketable character, but the whole thing that everybody loves about these books is that you get introduced to a vast array of characters. Mm -hmm. Because, well, I mean, look at look at my table, for example. Does Thomas feature any part of like these models? No. Mm -hmm. It's all other characters that we get introduced as we go on in the series because we gravitated to them. Well, it wasn't just the Thomas show. It's, that's why it's not called... Well, you know, the Thomas the Tank Engine collection. That's what it's called now, but it was called the Railway Series for a reason. It's about railway characters and how not everybody's going to have Thomas as their favourite well, from our kind of generation. Mm -hmm. I mean, my favourite is Percy. Yep. Well, yeah. Your favourite's Duck. Yeah, Toby. Yours is Toby. So it's all different characters that we've all grown, well, in, well, grown up with and became accustomed to it and enjoyed. So... I really have to. I have to agree with with the me. But this, when I watched these in series one, these were the ones I skipped because they were mm. boring to me. I didn't. I liked Terence and I liked Bertie. I liked them as characters. The other two stories were pointless. Thomas and the Guard is the worst story of season one. It's boring as shit. It's literally one of the stories you could tell in like a minute, and then it's literally finished. Yeah, it's like Thomas left his guard behind, and how can you catch up with him that quickly? Is he fucking the Flash? <laughs> yeah. Think about how far he would have travelled before he got to that signal. Yeah. There was no way that he would have had, uh, had that. We would have been waiting like three days before the guard caught up with him. <laughs> it's, uh, what? And then but, obviously the Thomas goes fishing one. I already said about, about you know, the fish. Really? He's <laughs> never really. I was never really a big big fan of it. I wasn't a fan of it as a kid. And if I wasn't a fan of it, and I was the target audience, what does that say about the book for an adult? Mm. So based on the on the guidelines, I've got to go nay. Mm. So, sorry, Tank Engine Thomas again. <laughs> you have been given the nay. You can all hate me now, guys. Thumbs down. I'll be interested to see this comment section. <laughs> well, to see what uh, the Thomas fandom thinks. A lot of them will disagree with me. Well, some of them might agree with me. That's the whole point. We want to encourage constructive opinion, but please no more death threats. <laughs> well, and, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. So we're two for two now. 
Well, well, well. And, and even steel. Perfectly aligned going into the next book, which is Troublesome Engines. Mm -hmm. And I really have to put my bias aside because I fucking love that book. <laughs> Absolutely. This is, this is where the stories get interesting. Yeah, this is when the, the real politics start to come in. Here think. we go. <laughs> yeah. As, as the Scottish way of saying it, here we fucking go. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll be looking forward to that one. Forward to then. Yes. Oh, I'm looking forward to it. Well, my, my favourite character gets introduced to Mercy. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, thank you so much for being a part of the what the continuing madness and what obviously the newbies coming in to the fold. Mm -hmm. Well, I hope you come back for the next one for Troublesome Engines so I can get to see a bit more about it. If not, I can totally understand it's a bit of a niche kind of thing. <laughs> well, I'll still pay you. <laughs> well, it's, been, it's been a pleasure it's been great I've really enjoyed myself thank you very much how about yourself Susan it's been fun it was um, it was better than I expected I enjoyed it that basically sums up my life better than expected <laughs> <laughs> so well, I'd heard yes, yes. <laughs> yeah Alison's been telling too many tales <laughs> yes proof Thomas fans can actually get wiped <laughs> yay so until next time everybody I've been Andrew Durning this has been from Thomas Side, Thomas Lawrence, Callum Knight. For the normies, this has been Susan Sutton, Matthew Hill. So until next time, my faithful followers, please keep on chugging.